Thank you. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. I am Esteban Jimenez, a second year PhD student. And today I'm going to talk to you about uh, how to use simulations to study the evolution of gas kinematics across cosmic time. So first of all, um, why kinematics is important? Well, because kinematics can be used as a tool to get more insights about the evolution of galaxies. Specifically, specifically we can uh, obtain information about why the galaxies at high redshifts are thicker, the disks are thicker, are more turbulent, but at wider lower redshift, uh, we see that the evolution, finally, this disk become thinner and with very order rotation and motions. Also, why the galaxies at the low redshift show very small velocity dispersion. So we can use, the purpose of this is use the kinematics in order to extract information from, uh, to uh, finally constrain all, of, all the physical models that study this. So one very particular uh, kinematic measurement that we can observe is the, evolution, is the evolution of the gas velocity dispersion. And why is it so important? Because this quantity encodes information about the dissipation and the position of energy across the cosmic time. So if we can understand very well the evolution of this uh, velocity dispersion, we can then um, understand or try to relate all of this with the, all the physical, uh, physical mechanisms that occur in galaxies and establish or constrain even more our models to model, for example, the star formation rate, the stellar feedback, and many others. So here I, can, I am showing you the evolution of the gas velocity dispersion in observations. And as you can see here, one thing that is import, very important here is that it, it is observed that the velocity dispersion increase uh, at higher redshifts, and it is very small at lower redshifts. So the main question of my project is try to understand what, which one are the physical drivers that are, are um, increasing or decreasing the gas velocity dispersion with time. So in the literature, there are three main uh, theories that try to explain, uh, that try to explain why the uh, gas velocity dispersion evolves. One of them is the stellar feedback, uh, which is, um, motivated by the fact that, by the observations that the velocity dispersion is very well correlated with the star formation rate, specifically at very high star formation rates. And also there is another theory, which is the theory of gravitational instabilities, which basically says that uh, in the galactic disk, you can sometimes form uh, gas clamps in the disk and that can make a transfer of energy at an, uh, a transformation of energy from gravitational energy to uh, kinetic energy and then increase the turbulence in the galaxy. And also, of course, there is the effect of the mergers and the environment. Uh, for example, here you can see that um, the mergers can change the, after a merger, after a merger, the angular momentum of a galaxy can change dramatically and then all the kinematic of the system will be affected. So the big problem with this in, to, to study all of this in observations is that these physical processes are a uh, couple, many of them, and also are interconnected. For example, gravitational instabilities can, can trigger stellar feedback, which in turn can um, uh, dissipate the, these gas clamps, and then uh, the gravitational instabilities stop existing. And also the mergers can trigger, can trigger star formation and then stellar feedback. So it's a process that is um, very coupled and it's difficult to study. And for that reason, in this project, we want to use the Eagle simulation um, because in the Eagle simulation, we have um, we, the outputs of the Eagle simulation provide us with a self-consistent uh, result of modeling of the dark matter and the gas and the stars at the same time. So from that, we can obtain the kinematic using the, uh, in this case, the gas particles from, from all our Eagle galaxies. So in order to compare our velocity dispersions with observations, we are using this formula, which basically is the vertical 
uh, the mass weighting vertical gas velocity dispersion, which uh, taking into account all the uh, components of the gas particles that are in the in, aligned with the angular momentum of the galaxies. So here in this plot, I'm showing you the uh, velocity dispersion of star forming gas. So try to mimic uh, the observation from H alpha measurements in the IFU surveys. And here I'm comparing this, um, the, all the, the solid lines correspond to the median relations for all the eagle galaxies uh, for, mass, for galaxies with masses about 10 to the 9. And here I'm comparing this with the observation from the KMOS survey. And as you can see here for, and also here I'm showing the different colors for different apertures. And here you can see that the, um, that the median relations fit very well with the data. So uh, that is a, a, a good news for us because it's saying that we can use Eagle to, to study this evolution. So first of all, um, what about the effect of stellar feedback? The effect of stellar feedback, uh, which I'm showing here, uh, here I'm showing the velocity dispersion as a function of the mass of the, of the galaxies. And a good advantage of using Eagle is that Eagle have a run that turn off the effect of stellar feedback. So when we compare the median relation of all the galaxies, of all our galaxies that don't have the effect of stellar feedback with the ones that do have, which are shown here as the blue line, you can see that there is a systematic offset between the two lines. So this is saying that basically the, the, the effect of stellar feedback is providing a floor for the velocity dispersion and it's actually making an impact on the, on the turbulence of the galaxies. Regarding the environment, uh, here the quantity that we are using to quantify this is the mass of the, is the, the amount of mass that is contained in the substructures in the, in the, in the galaxy. In, in the halo, sorry. So here I'm showing the velocity dispersion as a function of the mass contained in the substructures. So the larger this fraction is, the, the larger the amount of substructures you have, so you expect more um, dynamical interaction between the substructures and the central galaxy. So here you can see that the velocity dispersion tend to correlate better with this quantity at, for very high mass galaxies, which uh, co would correspond to uh, cluster environments in general. So it, yeah, that's okay, is what we would expect. And finally, the effect of uh, gravitational instabilities, the thing is that is, this is the most difficult quantity to measure in, in, in the simulation because you need very well resolution to measure this. Typically in observations, what is used is using IFU surveys and measuring the uh, maps of surface density, velocity dispersion. Um, but in Eagle, we uh, are trying to do the same here, but um, um, using the same map for only selecting galaxies that are very well resolved, so many gas particles and stellar particles. In order to quantify the gravitational instabilities, we are using this thumb range stability parameter, which basically quantifies a balance between the uh, restoring forces, which are the epicyclic frequency, which is uh, the kappa here, and the radial velocity dispersion and also the self-gravity of all the clamps that are in this galaxy, in, in the disk. And um, yeah, we're using these parameters so then to quantify these instabilities. So an, import, an important thing to say here is that this quantity is a local parameter that we, we need to measure all these quantities in, in, in the pixels. So that is what we are doing here with, the, with our little galaxies. So we get a map of surface density, a map of uh, velocity dispersion, and then we compute our Q parameters. So by doing that, we can obtain a map of the Q. Uh, we can obtain a map of the Q parameter, which is shown here in the lower left panel for the gas, but also generally is uh, also taking into account that the stars can trigger or can produce these clamps in the galaxies. So you need to take into account both in order to obtain a final uh, map which accounts for the, uh, for the clamps of gas and stars. And in general, values below, this is uh, color coded by the logarithmic of the Q parameter. So uh, all the regions, violet, reg violet regions here below one correspond to unstable, the unstable regime. So also uh, in order to, we also find that this, um, 
uh, that this key parameter correlates very well with the surface density. And actually, when we all these clamp, the clampy regions in the galaxy correspond to regions of very low Q, or Q in this case below 2.5 roughly. So when we, uh, we, what we did was define a clampiness fraction for all the galaxies, and then we uh, compare how, how are all of these in, in, for all the galaxies in different redshifts. And you can see here that many of the gas in the galaxies that are very clampy um, are located in, in a, for high redshift galaxies. But for low redshift galaxies, most of the galaxies most of the mass is not encloses in these clamps. So the gravitational instability are mo mostly more important at high rate than at lower rate. And finally, when we um, check how is the correlation of uh, an average sigma with respect to the fraction of the mass encloses in these clamps, we found that there is a, a correlation, a strong correlation, uh, which basically says that the galaxies that are more clampier and also are, have also higher velocity dispersion. So here you can see, for example, the images of the extremes of this in this, uh, in this distribution, where the galaxies that have very low, uh, a very low mass enclosing clamps tend to be very uh, well defined, but the uh, galaxies that have very high or a lot of uh, low, a lot of regions with low Q tend to be very disturbed. So uh, to summarize, we uh, explore these three different quantities, uh, th these three different physical processes, processes and find that basically stellar feedback is very important for low mass galaxies to increase the dispersion there. And gravitational instability is, is important to create these over density regions in the galaxy that also increase the velocity dispersion. And in the case of the mergers, we have, in the case of the environment, we have found that this is particularly important for uh, only the cluster uh, environments. So, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Esteban, for keeping um, very well to time. I see there's a question on the Slack from Anshu Gupta who asks, does the median and scatter change significantly if you use the star formation rate weighted instead of the mass weighted velocity dispersion? Um, we haven't tested that yet, but I think it wouldn't change too much. Um, I mean, if we keep using the galaxies that are in the main sequence, then the scatter, the thing is, uh, this velocity dispersion depends strongly with the star formation rate, but weakly with stellar mass. So, yeah, I would, I, I would need to test that, but I suspect uh, then my the scatter would be different. Yeah, sure. I see that there is at least one question in the Zoom chat and one question apparently incoming on Slack. Um, but what I might do is is cut in the interest of time. Um, ask uh, the next speaker is Jie Li um, to to take over the screen. So Esteban could ask you to release the screen and Jie, can you? Um, take over. Um, Esteban, mm -hmm. if you're still in microphone range. Yep. The sure, question sir. from Ken Freeman was whether you'd considered the effect, the effect of cold inflows from the hierarchy. Um, Is that a question you can ask without, you can, you can address without vis visuals? Yeah, yeah, actually we checked that as well and we found that um, these galaxies that have a lot of clams, so a lot of regions with low Q, also have very high cosmological accretion. The call accretion to these galaxies is very high too. So yeah, it seems that in order to sustain these instabilities across time, you need to have a constant accretion rate into the galaxies. Super. Um, well, uh, uh, in just a moment, let's thank Esteban at the same time as we um, welcome Jie Li, uh, who's speaking on angular momentum and the gas and dark matter during halo collapse. Um, 
I've messed that up. We should just welcome. Yeah, let, let's let's you know congratulate and welcome. And yeah, whenever you're ready, uh, uh, take it away. Yeah. So I take the microphone. Yeah. Hi everyone. I'm Jelly, a second year PhD student from Ikra UWA. Today I'm going to talk about the angular momentum of gas and dark matter during the halo collapse. So why do we study angular momentum? Angular momentum is a key property of galaxies. It determines the galaxy's size and relative to the other galaxies' properties, such as H1 gas fractions and the morphology. And because galaxies are formed from the gas within the halos, so in order to understand the angular momentum of galaxies, it is important to understand the angular momentum of gas within the halos. And at the beginning, the gas and dark matter particles mix together and they gained angular momentum from the tidal talks in the cosmic web. So it's very natural to assume that gas and dark matter has identical specific angular momentum. However, cosmological simulations have challenged these assumptions. They found that specific angular momentum of gas is slightly higher than that of dark matter within the halos, even there's no galaxies formation within the halo. So my PhD project is to understand why the specific angular momentum of gas is higher than that of dark matter within the halos. In the project, I've used the non-radiative simulations served based on the ICRA to investigate these questions. And the non-radiative simulations only include dark matter and gas particles. Also, gas has no cooling, so there is no galaxies formation within the halos. And so in SURFs, I select all the halos whose mass is larger than 10 to 12 solar mass. And then in the, on the left panel, I plotted the spin parameter distribution of dark matter and gas respectively. Spin parameter reflects the, how, the amount of spin for two different two components. So let's see the middle, middle panel of the left panel. It shows that the spin parameter distribution of dark matter remains nearly constant through the cosmic time. In the may, meanwhile, see the bottom panel of the see the bottom panel. The spin parameter distribution of gas gradually increased during the cosmic time. So there's no surprise when we make the ratio, the spin parameter ratio between gas and dark matter. It's the similar with the specific, the ratio of specific angular momentum of gas and dark matter. Let's see J gas over J dark matter on the right panel. So there's no surprise when we make the ratio between the specific angular momentum of gas and dark matter gradually increased during the cosmic time. At redshift five, this ratio is approximate to one and at redshift zero, this mean ratio is approximate to 1.3. So, so why? Why does the ratio of J gas over J dark matter gradually increase during the halo ev evolution? We try to get some hint from the inner halo properties. So in this plot, I, I plot the mass distribution and angular momentum distribution within one via radius. The point here is, see the bottom panel, within the 0 0.6 milliard radius, the angular momentum distribution of gas is obviously higher than that of dark matter. So we naively assume that something happened within the halos. For example, dark matter transfers some angular momentum to gas and make the gas spin up. So how does that happen? Last image here is an elliptical, elliptical halos here. Gas and dark matter mixed together. This halo rotates in the anti-clockwise direction. And then the halo collapses. 
because the dark matter is collapsing particles and gas has pressure. So dark matter would collapse faster than, faster than the gas and rotate ahead of gas. Talks are formed between these two components. And because dark matter rotates ahead of the gas, it transfers some angular momentum to gas and makes the gas spin up. In order to test if this hypothesis is right or not, we need to set up a series control simulations. So after, after a lot of trying, we focus on the simplest top hat model, which the density distribution is uniform within the halos. And I studied the simplest shape with its uh, sphere, and I, and, I uh, and I make the rotational axis along the z-axis. Then we select a prolate shape whose rotates along its long axis, and prolate shape rotates along its short axis. And then we select operate shape whose rotate along its short axis and operate rotate along its long axis. We can separate these shapes into two groups. One is they rotate symmetrically along their rotational axis. Another group is they rotate asymmetrically along their rotational axis. And Besides the shape, we also set up other parameters such as different spin parameters and different velocity dispersions. We simulated these halos in, in five, three, four times to make them reach their equi equivalent statement. So here is an example when the halo collapsed and reached their equivalent statement. And my interest is to investigate if the gas and dark matter evolves differently during the halo collapse. So in the next slides, I showed them separately. Oh. Well, Okay, yes, ho ho I hope every, everybody see that there's a movie. So that movie shows um, the gas and dark matter's density distribution is different when the halo collapse. And that makes torque forming within the halos and makes the angular momentum transformation possibly. So here I have shown the result from the different shape. As we can see, uh, for the symmetrical rotational halos, no matter what kind of shape you are, if you rotate symmetrically, there's no angular momentum transformation between gas and dark matter. And if you rotate asymmetrically, we can see the gas spin up and dark matter's angular momentum decrease. Dark matter transfers some angular momentum to gas. And also from this plot, plot, we can see different shape makes the amount of angular momentum transformation are different. So now it raised another question. Can we, can we find an asymmetric parameter which can predict how much angular momentum transfers between dark matter and gas? So after a lot of trying, Finally, we defined an asymmetric parameter which includes the geometry of the halo, the collapse factor, and the spin parameter. Here, the collapse factor is defined by the half mass radius in the initial conditions over the half mass radius at the final halos. And the collapse factor includes the information of shape and the velocity dispersion. And now we plotted the relation between the asymmetric parameter alpha and the spin transfer par parameter lambda, uh, delta lambda. So in order to link the result from our toy model to the cosmological simulations, we defined uh, delta lambda 
instead of J gas over J dark matter to, um, to measure how much angular momentum transfers from dark matter to gas. So we can see uh, for our control simulations, all the data points follows um, very well relation. So let's dream big. Can, can we apply the, this result into this toy model result into the cosmological simulations? So in the cosmological simulations, we trace all the particles for the selected halos back into redshift one, two, three and calculate their asymmetric parameter alpha and the spin transfer parameter delta lambda. And yeah, we are happy to see uh, the, colored, the colored point, which, com which comes from the cosmological simulations, follows the relations very well. Yeah. And however, all the halos from the cosmological simulations only select by their halo mass, which is uh, whose halo mass is larger than 10 to 12 solar mass. And we didn't do another selections. So in, um, so in our future work, in order to fairly compare the result from the, cosmo um, the control simulations and the cosmological simulations, we need to do another fun, uh, fun selections in our work. Also, um, we now trace back all the particles back into the high redshift. It's, it's not the same situation with the, with, the um, with the situations in the control simulations with the overdense halos collapse. So in our future work, we will improve these selections and to compare the results from control simulations and cosmological simulations fairly. So here is my conclusion. So this project give, gives an explanation of the enhancement of mean specific angular momentum of gas to dark matter in the non-radiative simulations. So basically this enhancement many comes from the talks between gas and dark matter during the asymmetrical collapse. Okay, that's my talk, thank you. And we do have time for one question. And if I can ask uh, Stefania, who's the next speaker to be ready to take over after that. Um, the question that I see from the Slack chat is from Scott Kroon that asks, what do you think will happen, who asks, what do you think will happen if you add gas cooling? Will the gas collapse more quickly and impact the amount of angular momentum transfer? Um, that's a good question. I haven't investigated because uh, I cannot get the direct answers from non-radiative simulations. Um, but I can guess um, there's something interesting happened if I'm not sure if it would cooling faster than uh, the cooling makes the gas collapse faster than the dark matter because gas has pressure uh, at that situations. But well, if, if my PhD is long enough, I will investigate the more complex simulations. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I guess we can all hope that you're finished well before that point, you know, one way or another. Yeah. But, um, uh, uh, can I ask that we simultaneously thank uh, uh, Jie at the same time as welcoming Stefania, who's going to be talking about bulges and disks in semi-cluster galaxies. Hi, uh, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So yes, I'm going to talk about some results from my PhD, which has been recently granted by Macquarie University. And the title of my thesis was Disentangling the Stellar Population Properties of Budgets and Disk in Some Cluster Galaxies. So the motivation for this work is because we still don't know how a zero galaxies form. In a possible formation scenario, we have a highly star-forming galaxies that due to uh, some processes stop to the star formation activity. And uh, what we had is a faded spiral from which we have the formation of an S0 that's characterized by a central bulge surrounded by an outer disk. 
So if we look at where a zero galaxies live in the universe uh, from the morphology density relation, we have that the most dense environments, uh, such as groups and clusters, have a higher percentage of these uh, uh, types of galaxies. And uh, um, so in this context, uh, uh, the aim of my thesis was to understand the formation of a zero galaxies uh, in these uh, uh, high density environments, so in clusters. And since uh, uh, they're characterized by uh, two components, we decided to do this by studying uh, the separate stellar population properties of bulges and disks. So to uh, separate the bulge from the disk, we, uh, we um, use a, a two-dimensional photometric uh, decomposition. And I uh, studied eight low redshift clusters uh, that belong to the SAMI cluster sample. And for this cluster, we have both uh, photometric and integral field uh, spectroscopic data. And this is the largest sample with available IFU data. And uh, so uh, for the photometric decomposition, I analyzed around 2000 SDSS and VST images. One is shown here on the right. And I used the uh, analysis packages profound and profit. So profound for uh, source detection. So here we can see the segmentation maps and profit for uh, the Bayesian galaxy profile fitting. And I performed this in GR and I bands. So what I'm aimed to do is, uh, uh, given the image of the galaxy, I want to uh, separate uh, the central light of the galaxy, of the galaxy, and that's the bulge component, uh, from uh, the outer light of the galaxies uh, that corresponds to the disk component. And uh, profit has been used a lot in the literature. So this is an image from Kuketol 2019, uh, where we have the data, the model using profit, and finally the residuals in the uh, three columns. And uh, we see the profit is able to reproduce different kinds of galaxy morphologies. So uh, galaxies that are uh, mainly dominated by one component, such as uh, these galaxy and uh, bulge galaxies, but also as zeros. That's the one I'm interested in, where we have the bulge in the center and then the surrounded disk. So this is my pipeline for uh, the, uh, the composition. So I started with Brown Fund, uh, where I um, use for search detection, sky subtraction, and in particular, Profound gives the uh, photometric and shape parameters inputs uh, to Profit, uh, which performs the actual uh, photometric fitting of the galaxy profile. So here I use profit in two steps. So the first one was that for each galaxy, I performed just a, a single component sexic profile and estimated the uh, respective likelihood. And then for each galaxy, I perform a double component uh, profile, fixing the disk to an exponential model. Uh, while for the bulge, I consider uh, models with increasing complexity and uh, leaving free more and more fitting parameters, such as the sexic index, uh, the angle and the axial ratio. And then I have a likelihood also for this uh, more complex model. And then I compare the likelihood from the single with the one from the double uh, component model and, in and they estimate the Bayesian factor. And in case this uh, base factor is higher than 60, then it was favoring the more complicated model for the galaxy. And so this is uh, some visual outputs. So on the left, we have a, a data model and a residual for um, a galaxy where uh, the best model is uh, uh, a double component one. So we can see uh, the central light which correspond to the bulge and the outer light which correspond to the disk. And this is, uh, we can see also this in 1D uh, on the right where I show the radius of brightness profile of the galaxy where we have the uh, red line representing the bulge light and uh, the blue that correspond to the disk light that dominates the outer part of the galaxy. So in this way, I was able to uh, select around 500 cluster galaxies characterized by uh, two components. And these galaxies are within 2.5 R200. So R200 is a proxy uh, um, for uh, the uh, cluster environment. So it represents the projected distance from the cluster center. And uh, uh, so most previous works uh, only focus within 1R200, which is the most serialized region of the cluster. Instead, in this way, I was able also to probe uh, the uh, cluster outer regions uh, where uh, pre-processing occurs. So where galaxy interactions and merger mainly affect the uh, galaxy properties before the galaxies actually are realized within the cluster. And we see that this uh, sample is a well representation of uh, zeros if we look at their uh, morphology types. 
So the first property I was uh, interested in looking was the uh, Belgian disc colors, uh, which are represented in uh, red and blue in this histogram. And uh, we see the badges have redder color than the discs, which is in agreement with uh, previous studies. Then I was interested in understanding how these colors change within the cluster environment. So uh, um, on the left, uh, I'm showing, uh, I select only galaxies belonging to the cluster core, while on the right, we have the galaxies uh, between one and 2.5 are 200 so in the cluster outskirts. And uh, uh, on the y-axis, we have the badge color, um, Gemini uh, color um, for the badge in magenta point and for the disk in blue points. And the x-axis represent the uh, distance from the cluster center. So we don't see any variation for the badge colors. So while we see that the disk colors becomes bluer uh, towards the uh, larger um, uh, cluster at larger cluster distances and this is particularly significant within the cluster core region and uh, uh, if uh, uh, we use another optical proxy for the environment which is the local galaxy density so these are exactly the same process before but now on the x-axis we have the local galaxy density and uh, we still don't see any change for the bulge colors and the only significant co correlation between uh, the uh, colors and the um, proxy for, for the environment is uh, for the disk colors and within the cluster core region so we don't see any evidence of pre-processing uh, acting in these clusters and we concluded that the uh, processing acting in the cluster core such as run pressure stripping and uh, strangulation act uh, on the disks uh, stopping the cell formation activity and these processes have a dominant role in the formation of a zero galaxies in clusters. Now, going back to this histogram, <clears throat> we have seen that badges have rather color than the disc. But is this due uh, because the stellar populations in the badge is older, or is it more metal rich, or both? So, to answer this question, here is where the SAMI Galaxy Survey steps up. So, um, SAMI Survey is an uh, integral field spectroscopic survey, and uh, um, for around 200 uh, of those 500 cluster double component galaxies, I was able to have SAMI data. And uh, so the SAMI data are uh, confined within one uh, R200. And to look behind uh, this uh, distance, uh, we're gonna need Hector. And so on the right, I show an image uh, of a galaxy that I was studying with the SAMI aperture uh, on red on it. So um, I want to understand why bulges are redder than the disks. So I estimate the age and the metallicity uh, for the two components uh, using single values for these properties, and I tested three different methods. So I'm gonna focus on a method that's based on stellar mass weights, and that has been developed in the context of my thesis. Uh, and then, um, so which I also compare with two other methods already present in the literature. So uh, this method is based on bulge and disk stellar mass weights. And uh, so starting from the bulge and disk decomposition, I was able to have a 2D map uh, for the G band and I band fluxes separate for the bulge and the disk. Now passing from the G minus I scholars to the stellar mass and binning everything for signal to noise reason, we can have the maps on the right separate for the bulge and the disk, which uh, represents the respective weights. So basically, uh, it, in, in each bin, uh, we have uh, uh, the contribution from the bulge or uh, from the disk to the total galaxy stellar mass. And uh, on the top, we can see that the, um, so the contribution from the bulge is higher uh, in the uh, central bin, and then it decreases towards the outskirt region of the galaxy, where instead the contribution from the disk to the uh, galaxy stellar mass is higher. And this is how we um, expect. Now, uh, for each of these bin, uh, in this uh, example, we have seven bin. Uh, using the SAMI, uh, SAMI data, we have a galaxy spectrum for each bin. And uh, using a full spectrum fitting technique, uh, in particular use PPXF, uh, we can fit these uh, spectra and we can have an age and uh, a metallicity for the galaxy for each of the spectrum. So I can build a 2D maps in age and metallicity for the galaxy, which is shown here on the right. So in this particular example, uh, the galaxy is younger in the center and more metal rich in the center, so the outer region are more metal poor and older. 
So bringing everything together, um, I want to find the age and the metallicity of bulges and disks. And the most uh, simple model we can think of is a linear model. And uh, so I can think that the age of the metal is, uh, in the age of the galaxy in each bin is equal to the weight in stellar mass from the bulge in each bin times the age of the bulge, plus uh, the weight in stellar mass of the disk in each bin times the age of the disk. And we can think the same equation for the metallicity. So uh, the fitting parameters at this point become the single values, um, uh, age, metallicity of bulge and disk. And uh, so on the right, we have the visual output of the fitting. So uh, the data, the first column, uh, correspond to um, the maps that I showed before, which are uh, the uh, galaxy um, age and metallicity maps. Then fitting this equation, we can have the model and finally the residuals. So the model, um, even if it's simple, is able to reproduce the data pretty well, even if we have a strong residual, in particular within uh, the central region of the galaxy. And this is because we consider only uh, single values uh, and uh, we don't take into account the radial gradients uh, um, in age and metallicity that are supposed to exist within the galaxy. Now, looking at the result, so on the y-axis, we have the age, on the x-axis, the metallicity. Uh, the blue ellipses correspond to the um, disk values and the red uh, circles to the bulge values, and each line connected the respective uh, bulge with the disk. And we have two plots because uh, uh, on the right, we have those galaxies where bulges are younger than the disk, and on the left, the bulges uh, that are older than the disk. But in both cases, bulges are uh, mainly more metal-rich than the disk. In fact, they tend to populate the right hand um, of the metallicity axis. And we find uh, the same results using uh, other two methods uh, from the literature. Now, bringing everything together, I want to understand why bulges are redder than the disks. So uh, on the y-axis here, we have the uh, bulge um, and disk uh, color difference as a function of the metallicity difference, and the points are color coded according to the age difference on the left, and age and metallicity are swapped on the right. And uh, we don't see any part, we see a scattered trend in age, so bulges can be either younger or older than the disks, uh, but they're mainly more metal rich. So redder barges tend to be uh, more metal rich than the uh, disks. So we concluded that the redder column in barges is mainly due to the uh, fact that the stellar population is uh, um, more metal rich compared to the disk instead of uh, differences in stellar population ages. Okay, so uh, to conclude, we study the formation of zero galaxies in clusters and uh, the two main results that I presented are that uh, for the formation of a zero galaxies in class, we don't see any evidence of pre-processing, uh, but we've seen that the uh, processes happen happening in the most serialized region have a dominant role. And uh, looking at the um, using SAMI data and disentangled age and uh, metallicity degeneracy, we've seen that the redder color in bulges uh, is due to their metallicity compared to the uh, age difference in stellar population. Thank you. Um, we do have um, only only a, a minute for questions. I see two two questions that I hope will be quick from um, or, or you know easy to answer quickly from uh, Sabina Belstedt, who asks: When you bin the spexels to extract age and metallicity values, do you need to remove the kinematic information before you do the binning? And then, if I can combine also with a question from Robin Cook, who asks: Are your bulges typically well resolved, and how reliable are the colors if not? So the two questions are about um, uh, the, the velocity part of the spectrum before you rebin and the spatial resolution um, to, to measure reliable color. Yeah. So the uh, binning uh, for the um so for the semi spectra follow uh, uh, so follow the uh, G band flux basically and the uh, kinematics is they're corrected for the when I been the spectra then they're corrected for the kinematics following Evelyn Johnson uh, 2014 method. Um, and the second question was, uh, so for the bulges, yeah, we had to put a lot of cuts in, uh, uh, for example, um, in the uh, full weight of maximum compared to the PSF or if the CERCIC index was too high. So we try to um, yeah, discard all those cases and have only uh, cases where the bulges were resolved. So even point sources cases, this, all these kinds of cases, we throw them out. <laughs> 
Um, fantastic. I see that there is a lot of activity on the Slack channel, so I, I, I think there might be um, uh, a few questions incoming. Um, let's let's thank and congratulate Stefania um, while uh, Pujan gets ready to, to take it away with her talk. Thank you. Hey, uh, just checking if you can hear me. Awesome. So, um, thank you, Nen, and um, thank you everyone for joining me for the talk. My name is Poojin, and today I'll be talking about my work on bridging the gap between stellar evolution and gravitational wave events. Well, let's first get started by understanding that why there exists a gap at all. The gap exists because of uh, stars which are more massive than nine solar masses at the time of their birth. We call them massive stars. These stars, when they end their lives, become neutron stars and black holes. And these neutron stars and black holes, their merger gave rise to the gravitational waves that we can currently detect. So in this way, massive stars have a central role in gravitational wave astronomy. But there's a small problem that despite their importance, their evolution of massive stars is pretty uncertain. For example, we still do not know how much mass they lose through stellar winds. What are the different nuclear reaction networks that operate inside them and at what rates? And then there are processes like rotation, mixing, and if you're trying to model the evolution of these stars, numerical factors also play a crucial role. So just, and because of these uncertainties, different stellar evolution codes have to make different assumptions about uh, how, uh, the, for this physical um, uh, properties of stars. And because of this, they can predict quite different evolutionary pathways. To give you an idea of how different these uh, uh, predictions can be, we compare stellar models from four different codes. So we have stellar tracks from BFAS, from the Bond code, from MIST, uh, that is uh, stellar tracks from MESA, and from the PASIC code. And we compare um, these uh, four um, tracks from these four codes, the non-rotating stellar models at 0.014 metallicity. Uh, and this is what we get. So on the x-axis, we have the initial mass or the zero-age main sequence mass of the star. And on the y-axis, we have the remnant mass of the star as calculated with the Bijinsky et al. 2008 prescription. The different colored lines here represent the different stellar models. Now, you can clearly see that in this little region, roughly um, about up to 20 solar masses, all the stellar models agree pretty well for their predictions of remnant mass. But as you start going higher up in initial mass, the predictions for remnant mass starts to diverge. And at the rear end, it can be as high as uh, 20 solar masses. So this is quite huge uh, in terms of remnant, uh, difference is quite huge in terms of remnant mass prediction. Now, um, for massive stars, the story uh, doesn't end there, it can, becomes even more complicated as most massive stars do not occur as isolated single star. They instead occur in the form of stellar binaries or triples or in more dense cluster-like environments. So we have to take that into account and we need to evolve population of these massive stars and also take into account the different interactions between them. So these interactions would be like dynamical interactions in star clusters or interaction due to a binary companion. And that's where population synthesis codes come into picture. As the name suggests, these codes do exactly this. They evolve a large population of stars and take into account the different interactions between them. Now, the traditional way stellar evolution uh, has been modeled in these population synthesis code is through fitting formulae to 1D stellar tracks. What uh, is done in this method is you calculate a set of uh, stellar evolution tracks from 1D stellar structure and evolution code. Um, by the way, these, uh, doing so requires a lot of computer memory and can take hours to watch just a single star. So what we do is just compute a few tracks and then define fitting formulae to these tracks. And then we use these fitting formulae in the population synthesis code to evolve uh, tracks every time. And in this way, we bring down the computation time from hours to few seconds or less than a second. A good example of this method is the single star evolution fitting formulae package developed by Hurley et al. in 2000. It's based on polynomial fits to the stellar tracks by Paul et al. A great advantage of using this method is uh, it's computationally inexpensive, it's fast and robust. The downside, however, is these fitting formulae are not adaptable to uh, changes in the stellar tracks. So if we want to use or uh, test different stellar models, we have to redefine these formulae, and these are difficult to calculate. So it's not an easy job to test different models by this method. And therefore, 
for my PhD, I have developed a different method, method of interpolation for single star evolution. As the name suggests, it uses interpolation. So again, we evolve set of uh, stellar evolution tracks from 1D codes, but then we interpolate between them on the fly to calculate um, the st different stellar parameters at any instant. Uh, again, the advantage of this method is it's again fast and it's slightly um, more computationally expensive than SSC, but uh, in based on today's age, it's still very inexpensive. And the best part is it can make use of different sets of stellar models. Now, um, although I do say it here, today I won't have time to go into this part much, but what I really want to show here is even if we use same set of data, so if we just use um, false at all tracks, what's the difference between SSE and METI? So what's the difference between fitting formula and interpolation? To, so to test this, we um, compare um, METIs with SSE uh, using the false at all tracks. And these are the same set of tracks that were used in calculating SSE fitting formula. Um, a, a quick note about these tracks that they were computed without any mass loss. So the mass of star remains constant throughout its evolution. And for this particular uh, presentation, I'm just using the metallicity of 0.01. So this is what we get. In this HR diagram over here, the solid lines represent uh, the stellar tracks interpolated by Matisse, and the dashed lines show the stellar tracks computed by SSE. We can see that there's a quite a good agreement if we do not consider mass loss um, here. So the tracks agree pretty well. But the, in reality, stars do lose mass. They lose mass to stellar winds. They also can lose mass to binary interaction. And therefore, therefore, we do need to take into account mass loss. For just stellar wind mass loss, we can simply use tracks with mass loss as input in Matisse and can interpolate between them. But for binary, we uh, still need to add um, some mass loss mechanism. And that's what we did. So now, again, switch to um, using the same set of tracks, but now adding mass loss. This is how the picture changes. So these are again, same tracks, but now I'm using mass loss rates from Bijinsky et al. 2010. And again, solid lines represent the tracks interpolated by Matisse, and the dashed lines show the tracks um, by SSE. The tracks agree quite well on the main sequence because these stars uh, do not lose much mass uh, on the main sequence. But over here, uh, when the stars become the supergiants during the core helium burning phases, you can see that there's a slight dis disagreement between SSE and Matisse. Uh, for this 25 solar mass star, SSE predicts that a star is burning helium in its core, its radius will continue to increase and it will become, uh, go to higher uh, uh, radii and lower effective temperatures. But Matisse says, no, it's gonna turn back and it will end its life at comparatively lower, um, higher uh, surface temperature and lower radii. Now this may seem small here, and not much different, but these differences have, can have quite a lot of impact on, for example, binary evolution of the stars. So let's consider these two um, 15 and uh, 25 and 15 uh, solar mass stars and just put them in a binary. And this is what happens. So just uh, to explain what we did here. So we use the binary stellar evolution code BSC, and then um, in the dash lines here are the result uh, that we get when we use SSC fitting formulae for stellar evolution. And in the solid lines are the results when we use Matisse or fit, uh, interpolation for stellar evolution. Now, I have been showing a lot many um, HR diagram, but let me elaborate this slightly further. So let's see what uh, SSC predicts. So we start with um, a 25 and 15 solar mass star at roughly uh, separated by um, roughly 2000 solar radii. Both these stars evolve and um, the primary stars, it expands and becomes a red supergiant, is able to fill its social lobe and transfer material to secondary. It does so until the end of, end of its life, until it undergoes a supernova and forms a nine solar mass black hole. But in the process, it is able to transfer five solar mass of material to the secondary. So now this 15 solar mass star here, which was on main sequence, accretes the five solar mass and lives rest of its life effectively as a 20 solar mass star here. And when it, uh, it further evolves and when it ends its life, it forms a 2.2 solar mass neutron star. With Matisse, the picture changes slightly. So the, uh, the process is same, but the numbers are, uh, the masses are now these ones and shown in the blue boxes. So again, uh, in Matisse, the, both stars uh, start their life same way. 
But then uh, the mass transfer doesn't start until uh, the star has finished hel burning helium in its core. So it starts quite late in the evolution. And the, uh, this star is able to transfer only one solar mass of material to the secondary. And therefore, the secondary ends its life as a quite less massive uh, neutron star, so just a 1.3 solar mass neutron star. So this is just one example of how small differences in all these tracks and even just the method can have on the on predicting binary properties. And this is, um, yeah, so again, I, I won't be showing uh, more results if we, for example, use MESA tracks instead of pole, tra pole track, um, but there will be many more results um, that will become part of my future talk. So I'll just uh, leave you with my summary slide and we'll take any questions. Thank you. Um, thank you for um, keeping spectacularly well to time. I can see that there is typing. But maybe I can, maybe I can ask a, a, a naive question. Um, I think you were, you were showing um, the, the comparison between sort of interpolated versus um, uh, fitting formulae. Um, is it, uh, am, I, am I naive to want to know what is the right answer as it comes straight from the model? Um, is, is there a reason that that, that, that comparison is, is difficult to, to plot or compute? Yes, um, that's a really good question, in fact. Um, so, so there is one thing, both fitting formulae and interpolation are an approximation to the actual evolution. And as, as I shown like pretty early in the talk, even with detailed models, even with all these models, we still don't know how exactly these stars evolve. And then we are using these approximations. So uh, I do, did test uh, all the, so not with Paul's track, but I did test Matisse with uh, MISA track. So I evolved like a few tracks without any mass loss and added mass loss uh, on top of that and see uh, which one, SSU or Matisse is like shows us closer behavior. It seems like uh, Metis, which is doing like a similar job, there are still is, uh, differences. It's not exactly same as adding mass loss in a detailed stellar evolution track uh, code. But yeah, I think I would. I think I can safely say here that Metis is doing a better job. Um, thank you for that. There, there, there are um, a number of um, questions that have just popped up um, on the Slack. So I, I'm just going to have to pick one. Um, more or less at random. Um, I will choose the Mia who asks, what's the effect for the rate of binaries expected when Matisse is used to some other code like BPASS? Um, and could I ask while you, while you answer um, if you could disconnect um, so that Stephanie can be ready to begin? Um, yeah, um, so I think we haven't uh, reached to that part yet where we compare Matisse with BPASS, but that's something like I think I will be able to better answer that question in the future. We will look forward to that. So if everyone can, can thank Pujan again and welcome Stephanie at the same time. Stephanie, um, you're clear to start whenever you are ready. Thank you. Perfect. Well, I'm just going to make sure to do the obligatory. It's progressing. <laughs> Check. Okay, good. So um, thanks very much um, for the chance to speak here. Um, so I'm a PhD student from the ANU, so I'm working with um, Francois Rigaud and Ken Freeman. Um, most of my work is on understanding stellar populations um, with regards to, to the MAVIS instrument. So, um, so this one is specifically about MAVIS and the work we're doing to model uh, what MAVIS will be able to do before it goes on sky uh, with a specific reference to globular clusters. So um, just as an overview before we get into MAVIS, maybe we could go back to Astro 101 and talk about adaptive optics. So, so MAVIS is an adaptive optics instrument. Um, so I'll tell you a bit more about her in the next slide, or it in the next slide. But um, so let's review the major components of an AO system. Essentially adaptive optics is there to remove the turbulence from the atmosphere, take the twinkle from our stars and allow our telescopes to operate like they're in space. So uh, the major components, we have a deformable mirror, uh, a wavefront sensor, and then this massive block, which is the real-time computer, the RTC, the brain of the AO system. So the light from the uh, teles or from the uh, from the the atmosphere, the telescope comes in, hits the deformable mirror, um, where a partial correction is applied. So we're trying to make that curly wavefront flat, 
uh, that corrected light is sent to our science instrument, part of it. The rest of it is sent to our wavefront sensor where we try to make that correction even better. So we're going to measure the, the aberration to the wavefront. Fancy way of saying, trying to make the wavefront flat. The real-time computer then uh, uh, relates that information back to the differmal mirror, which applies the correction. So again, it allows us to build big telescopes, big instruments, and have them operate as if they're in space or close to being in space. So um, classical AO, so this is the picture for classical adaptive optics. This is um, sort of was implemented in the 90s and 2000s and almost all eight meter telescopes now have an AO system on them. So the, it's of course pretty powerful, but um, delivers a correction across a relatively small field of view. Um, so the next flavor of adaptive optics that's going to be um, really implemented by both uh, well, the ELT and the TMT is called MCAO. So it provides a larger corrected field of view, 10 to 20 times as big as classical AO, but uh, comes with some complications of its own. So here's a sort of simplification of an AO system. So I've showed you the really simple, now we go one step further. And so I just wanna point out to you here that we use these reference sources we call natural guide stars and laser guide stars. Obviously natural guide stars occur naturally, laser ones we produce ourselves. Um, and so what MCAO does is really it multiplies the number of natural guide stars and laser guide stars, multiplies the number of wavefront sensors, and multiplies the number of deformable mirrors. So, and that allows us to get the larger field of view. So, um, so I'll be talking a bit about laser guide stars and natural guide stars throughout, so just wanted to refresh those. So the only MCAO system that's in operation today that's really giving us all the information we have currently about how these systems operate, how, they, how well they can do, is GEMS. So that's on Gemini South, which is an eight meter telescope, and it operates in the near IR. So it's important to know that all uh, future ELT MCAO systems will be operating the near IR. So here's just to show you how much bigger you can go with MCAO. So this little blue square here, is the classical adaptive optics, my cat's just entered the room, uh, with the blue square here. So that's just a small field of view you get from classical. And then this much larger field is uh, what you can correct with multi-conjugate adaptive optics. So it's 85 arc seconds by 85. And then of course, we're going from seeing, seeing limited to single conjugate, classical to MCAO. So you can see that they, the correction improves. Okay, so MAVIS is an MCO instrument that uh, operates in the visible. So this is the first time this has ever been done uh, for nighttime observing. MCO in the visible has been done to observe the sun, which is pretty cool. But MAVIS will be uh, used for nighttime observing. So it's being designed for the East, uh, East, ESO uh, UT4 telescope, the VLT, and it's going on the adaptive optics facility. So a system that already has lasers um, operating very well. So it's the first, first one to operate in the visible. This comes with a lot of challenges, as you can imagine. So, but then it has some rewards. So the big reward with Mavis is that um, visible AO increases the spatial resolution uh, substantially. So of course, as you uh, go bluer, bluer, the diffraction limit becomes smaller, so your spatial resolution increases. So Mavis has a, a spatial resolution um, increased by a factor four relative to um, a system that's observing in the IR, and that's comparable to the ELT in the K band. So we actually have a lot of synergy with the ELT. Um, so yes, yeah, so it's some impressive stats if you if you uh, think about spatial resolution. So maybe this is performing very close to the diffraction limit. So I've just included a little plot to show you where it falls in uh, relative to existing instruments and those that are being built. So you can see it kind of occupies this unique regime in wavelength space versus angular resolution. And then of course we're pushing down the angular resolution is really on par with the ELT. So uh, specifically with, with Mavis, we have this challenge of delivering really high precision astrometry. So the VLT is not an instrument that was designed specifically, a telescope that was designed specifically for astrometry. So it's quite difficult versus the ELT that's being built with astrometry in mind. So let's just talk about what is astrometry to begin with. Um, so it's really uh, measuring the positions and parallaxes of, of objects. So there's two flavors. There's what Gaia does, which has really been, been famous for this. So it does absolute astrometry. So that's uh, no reference sources. You have a global reference frame, and, uh, but you don't need any reference sources in the field of view to determine where the object is. So that's just a single Barnard star sitting out there in the middle of nowhere, and you want to detect where he is. Um, a differential astrometry is slightly easier. So this is relative to another object in the sky. So that's a tiny Barnard star, and we want to measure the distance between them. 
So when we do repeated astrometric measurements, uh, we can achieve or we can measure proper motion. So this is the true motion of objects. This is again what Gaia has really made famous. Um, it's quite difficult to do, but Mavis will have to do it. So there's a little proper motion um, movie of Barnard Star. So Mavis has a goal of 50 micro arc second precision. So if that number doesn't mean anything to you, at least recognize that it's, uh, well, it's the same as the ELT. So we have to achieve the same precision as a 39 meter telescope that's being designed to do this uh, explicitly. So um, before Mavis goes on sky, which is about 2027, we need to verify for ourselves and for ESO that we will be able to achieve these uh, astrometric requirements. So this was the driver behind building this simulating tool we have called Mavisim. So Mavisim simulates Mavis images. Uh, so we're modeling realistic Mavis photometry. So uh, image simulators exist all over the place and it's really amazing. They almost come with every instrument today. Uh, the tricky part about Mavis is because of it, it's an adaptive optics instrument and specifically an MCAO, M MCAO instrument, it comes with a lot of challenges. So um, we have to build in those errors from the get-go to make sure we can verify our science cases. So I'm just going to give you a schematic of Mavisim. So I'm starting with uh, what we call the system PSF. So this is where the turbulence conditions and the AO, so the imprint of Mavis go into building this system PSF. This can be an approximation or can be an end-to-end -end simulation. And then we couple that with uh, trying to capture as many of the AO air terms as we can through what we call the air kernel. And then uh, finally, we add some detector noise, um, some skies, some other uh, throughput and um, uh, filter curves, things like that to create a final image. So to, we couple those science, uh, the, those simulated images we created um, to, create, to actually measure the astrometry in those images. We do a rough pass, and then we use a PSF fitting photometry. So this is a pretty standard tool for crowded field photometry or stellar photometry. So we use um, DEO Phot. It's a um, good old Fortran code. It's been around for a while, and it does exceptionally well. So I wanted to talk to you about these two terms today, just to talk a bit about why they're so complicated. So I'm just wary of time. OK, so um, one of the things that MCO images are famous for uh, is the field variability of the PSF. So as you move throughout the image, the PSF changes quite a bit. So it makes it difficult when you're trying to extract the photometry using a single PSF. You really have to have a PSF that varies across the field to capture this. Um, the reason for this is, is anisoplanetism, not just a fun word, also a fun error. Um, so it essentially, the further you move away from your natural guide star or your laser guide star, the less turbulence in common you share. So if you're trying to observe this off-axis star, you'll see that there's a big chunk of turbulence that it doesn't share in common with a natural guide star. So it means that you can't apply a perfect correction because you're missing some of the information you need. So to show you what that does, the further you move away from the guide star, the more uh, distorted your PSF comes and it becomes elongated in the radial direction. So this is pointing towards the center of the image. And you can see in the slice here that um, the distribution of light is quite different. The other error we ha uh, have to tackle is from the natural guide stars uh, specifically. So depending on how the natural guide stars are arranged in the field and depending on how bright they are, they basically sort of act like a Gaussian kernel. They smooth, they add a lot of broadening and blurring of the PSF. So, and they also have a spatial variability. So here's just a representation of the kernel relative to the three natural guide stars. And so I've showed you here, no tip tilt and some tip tilt. So you can see it just really blurs your PSF. It makes it ha much harder to extract um, astrometric information. Okay, so the science case I wanted to mention, the one that we've been able to test with Mavisim, is uh, the case of intermediate mass black holes and globular clusters. So I won't talk about globular clusters. Um, Maddie McKenzie will talk about that tomorrow, the Bach uh, winner from this year. So, um, but I will mention to you these, yeah, intermediate mass black holes. So globular clusters are, are potentially a site where we could find these. And this is just to show you velocity dispersion versus black hole mass, that there's this big regime missing where um, we know we have stellar mass black holes, and of course we have supermassive black holes, but have yet to, to really find um, sort of mass in, in the mass range, 1,000 to 10 to the 5 solar mass black holes. So they could form through one array mergers and cluster centers. One has been found in a young uh, cluster, but not yet in a globular cluster. So what we did is um, take an n-body model from Holger Baumgart with a planted intermediate mass black hole in the middle and simulated the cluster 3201, NGC 3201. So here's a Mavisim image and just showing you the PSF changes across the field. 
Um, so I did that and then I simulated a 10 year epoch, recovered the astrometry of the proper motions and uh, went searching for the signature of a black hole. So uh, lo, and behold, lo and behold, we found it, which is exciting. So that's why I said we could detect intermediate mass black holes. So the dynamical signature that you're seeing here is the stars closest to the cluster center feel the presence of the black hole and of course they speed up. Their velocity reflects that, similar to the Milky Way center. So you're seeing the velocity dispersion as a function of distance from the cluster center, going from zero to up to 20 arc seconds. And then you see this big tick up in velocity dispersion uh, due to the presence of the planted intermediate mass black hole. So I'm just going over that here. So comparing our results to Gaia and HST, so we have very small errors in the center, which is really exciting. So we were able to push to, we can push further than, than four arc seconds, but of course the errors shoot up. So I've measured about 300 stars in each bin uh, into about four arc seconds and recovered a very tiny 0.23 kilometers per second. So this is the same error that Gaia recovers in the outer 60 arc seconds. So Gaia is too crowded uh, in this part to measure the dispersion. That's just because Gaia is a smaller telescope. Um, and then HST hasn't actually measured a dispersion uh, profile in 3201, but in a similar cluster, uh, we saw so about the same distance, same size, uh, that the crowding limit was around seven or eight arc seconds. So HST would not see the turn up that we do. And the other exciting thing is that we recovered six times more stars than HST did. So we are going deeper than HST. All right, so I'll just summarize here. So um, many of you will know me this because you're either on the science team or you've attended the workshop or uh, you know just heard of it. So that's great. Um, I just really want to get you excited because it is an Australian-led uh, instrument. So that's really awesome. And uh, let you know that we are testing science cases now. So if you have any in mind, please do reach out. Um, this this was a really exciting test case that resulted in you know ESO being happy as well. So so hopefully we can all work together. And then the last thing I'll put is. Um, but I uh, wanted to advertise that we have this Mount, Mount Stromlo student seminars uh, in November for students. Uh, so this is going to be a hybrid in person and online event. So um, there's the link as well for students to register. It's free. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, that was a, a great talk, Stephanie. Thank you. And, and perfectly on time. Um, so we do have time for, for one or two questions. I have, can I make sure that Aaron Ludlow is setting up? Um, I haven't made contact with Aaron. So if he's not setting up someone, yell. Um, the question that I have on Slack at the moment is from Alessandro Paduano, who asks, could MAVIS detect stellar mass black holes in globular clusters or only sensitive to intermediate, intermediate mass black holes? Yeah, that's a great question. So. Um, Muse has done some really fantastic work. Um, I think Sebastian Common has led a lot of work um, finding some stellar mass black holes in globular clusters already. And they're starting to pick up steam now that they have the narrow field mode online. So, um, and so Muse does that um, not through proper motions like I've done, right? But they do it through radial velocities. So we also, Mavis will have a spectrograph um, with a higher resolution than, than Muse. So, and then of course we have a higher spatial resolution than Muse. So I expect that this will be, yeah, Mavis should be able to detect uh, stellar mass black holes in, in at least the Milky Way globular clusters. Yeah. I do see that there is at least one person typing in the Slack. If there's anyone online who wants to put their hand up, now, here's the question from Gary DaCosta, who asks, how sensitive is your central sigma to the number of observed stars? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. So um, I did push down to 100 stars so that I could get into like the inner two arc seconds. And then the sigma probably increases by a factor three. So you get to about, or maybe a little bit less. I think I got to about 0.45 or 0.5 kilometers per second when I sort of slashed the number of stars but pushed further in. So um, yeah, so definitely it still is sensitive to that, but um, it's, uh, you know, hopefully if the signature of the turn up like we see is around four arc seconds, then it's, then it's okay to get that close and not have to go any closer to the center. That answers your um, awesome. Uh, there, there, <laughs> I'm sure there will be more um, comments and, and questions on Slack, um, but maybe if we can, if Stephanie, you could release the screen and we'll hope that Aaron takes over. Um, so that, let's thank Stephanie again. Yep. Um, and Aaron, whenever you're ready, um, please take it away.
Am I on camera? We have your screen and we hear your audio. Okay, uh, good. Uh, All right. Nice. So I'm going to thanks everyone for staying, sticking around for this session. I'm going to talk about uh, collisional heating of disk galaxies in cosmological simulations. Actually, most of the results I'm going to talk about are not based on cosmological simulations, but on idealized ones. Um, Do you go down? Okay. Uh, so I know I realized when I was just walking up here that I don't really have a good motivation for this talk because the real motivation was uh, um, an email that Mike Fall sent to Yokshe about a year and a half ago when I can't remember who it was. And even if I did, I probably wouldn't say their name. There was a paper that appeared on the archive. It was about the evolution and origin of galaxy morphologies in Eagle or Illustrious, one of those big simulations. And he basically said, yo, surely you can't believe any of this stuff, right? Like people can't study morphologies and simulations that where galaxies are resolved with only a few thousand particles. There must be collisional effects that are destroying the morphologies or at least giving them spurious origins. And Yop and I had at the time been discussing related things for uh, a couple of years before that, actually. So we decided that this was actually an avenue, something that was worth pursuing because, you know, these simulations are only getting bigger and better. And they're, the data access to these simulations is actually pretty tremendous now because all of the data is online. And people throw this information in their plots probably without really considering the numerical limitations. Right? And it's, it's easy to do that because we don't understand the numerical limitations of these simulations. It's very easy to bury all that stuff underneath the calibration of subgrid physics, if you want. You get a beautiful answer in the end, but you could calibrate over the fact that there's numerical physics that you don't want present, that is present, right? Uh, so just to give a basic outline of what uh, collisional relaxation is, this is the, the basic uh, uh, gist of my talk here. Um, you can imagine you got, and this is a very simple calculation, an order of magnitude estimate. You imagine you have a test particle in a system of n particles, right? And that's on an orbit, a circular orbit or something like that, even on a, on a radial trajectory. Uh, now, what you want to do is calculate the time scale over which that particle has its kinetic energy changed by of order the initial value that it has, right? And you can do that. And all it depends on, if you make some simplifying assumptions, is the number of particles that are in that system. It's actually the number divided by the logarithm of the number. All right. And so what that means is that in systems where n is very large, like a galaxy, a globular cluster, or a dark matter halo, or something like that, where n is huge, all of these systems are purely collisionless, right? And simulations need to emulate that behavior, otherwise they get the wrong answer. And of course, simulations don't simulate galaxies with the same number of particles that there are in reality. So to some extent, they are more affected by collisional relaxation than, than a, a real galaxy is. Right? And so for a simulation that's cosmological, for example, the, the number of particles is just proportional to the mass of the system. And so that means that at least below some mass scale, you can't neglect these collisions. All right? And so the question is, what is that mass scale and how bad is the effect actually? All right. Oh. I'm sorry. All right, so, you know, there's, there's a pretty common misconception actually related to this stuff, and that's that in simulations, oh, you just put in a gravitational softening, and then that gets rid of the collisional relaxation, right? Because you suppress these hard scatterings, these large angle scatterings. Turns out that those scatterings are actually extremely rare in simulations, right? So even though they are destructive, and you definitely want to avoid them, it's the integrated effects of all of the long range scattering that actually affects this thing. So you can't soften away if you want the effect of collisional relaxation. If you just repeat this simple calculation that I just described of a test particle in orbit about some system of M particles, but now the, the, the forces are softened, what you get is that it's still the collisional relaxation rate is still proportional to just the number of particles in the system, but you replace the logarithm of the number of particles by the logarithm of the ratio of the size of the system to softening. And that's, a, that's basically the same order as the, as the log of the number of particles. So you don't actually change things that much. You can show this quite easily. Uh, so for now a galaxy in simulation is not like a dark matter halo or a globular cluster that's a single component. The situation is a little bit worse and a little bit more complicated because if you can't neglect collisions, then what you end up with is a, is a, is a situation where the system wants to get towards energy partition. 
And that's when you have an equal balance between the average kinetic energy of the stellar particles and the dark matter particles. So that's like a galaxy, right? And so that's given by this approximate inequality here, written as a ratio. It's the, it's the ratio of the mass of the stars to dark matter particles times the ratio of the square of their velocity dispersions is about one. That's what you would get if energy competition was satisfied. So now, in a typical simulation, in the vast majority of simulations, I should say, the ratio of the particle masses are not equal. And that's because you sample the initial conditions with the same number of particles. And so the typical baryon to dark matter particle mass ratio is about five. It's given by the cosmology, it's given by the ratio of the omega uh, dark matter to baryons. And of course, stars, they don't form from dark matter particles. They form from gas, that's cool. It's lost all its velocity dispersion. And so the kinematics of the stars inherit that the kinematics of the gas and their velocity dispersions are actually much different as well. So this means that any collisions that exist are going to tend to heat that galaxy at a rate that's, that's much larger than, say, the dark matter scattering would heat itself. That's basically what I said. So what we, we, we wanted to test this, right? So what we basically did was we set up some idealized models of disk galaxies, and we made sure that they were in equilibrium and that they were stable to tumor instabilities and bar instabilities. And, you know, they're they're basically set up in a way that the, their solutions to the collisionless Boltzmann equation. So if the system is collisionless, it should stay that way basically infinitely long if you simulate it right with enough particles. And so I'll show the results of some of these simulations now just, you know, to, to make a statement, these are set up to be something like the Milky Way, the disk of the Milky Way in a halo that's roughly similar to the Milky Way's halo or what we know about it. Of course, these are scale free simulations because they're just based on gravity, but this is uh, the scale that's set here. So this is the initial conditions of one of the higher resolution simulations. You can see uh, the dark matter is represented just by faded blue points in the back. And you can see there is some coarseness to the particle load in dark matter. And then the stars are just the white particles, right? And so after five giga years, this is what this particular galaxy looks like. This is five giga years of, you know, quote, equilibrium evolution. And so this still looks pretty much like a disk galaxy, right? It, it actually looks worse in the picture than it does if you were to quantify the, you know, the change in the kinematics or the change in the structure of this galaxy. Um, now, we, you can repeat the same experiment, but just subsample the dark matter particles and stars. So you keep everything the same, except for now you just have fewer particles in the halo, right? So this is what the initial conditions would look like for a coarser version of that halo. You can see already that, well, you can see there's fewer stars because you see every one of them. But you can see as well that the clumpiness of the dark matter is much more, much more noticeable in this case. And so that's all just due to Poisson noise in the sampling of the, of the particles that belong to the dark matter halo. So simulate this one now and show it again at five giga years and you can see it basically looks nothing like a disk, right? And so these are, this is not just an academic exercise either. These are sorts of galaxies that would appear in simulations like Eagle and Illustrious and you may confuse this, what initially was a disk by construction with something that's like a dispersion supported rotating elliptical like galaxy. And so quantitatively, you can actually measure these things, right? You can go out and do your simulations, repeat them over and over for different numbers of dark matter particles and different numbers of stars and ask the question, how do the kinematics of those stars change as a result of collisional heating? And so that's what's shown in this plot. In the top, in the top left panel is the radial profiles of the vertical velocity dispersion. So that's the, the dispersion of the stars in and out, up, up and down from the relative to the midpoint of the disk plane. And the second panel is uh, the radial velocity dispersion that's in the disk plane. And then the bottom panel is the scale height, right? It's the half mass scale height. It's just the median radio, the median vertical height of stars above and below the disk. And of course, the different colored lines are different uh, dark matter particle mass resolutions. So the black being the highest resolution and then going down in resolution to until you get to the blue points. And you can see there that, well, there's a couple of interesting things here. One is that none of these simulations converge, right? They're all affected at all radii by collisional heating. And the second thing is that the collisional heating rate is proportional to the dark matter particle mass, right? Actually, because this is scale free, it's not really proportional to the mass of dark matter particles, it's proportional to the number of particles that are used to sample the halo. So what this means is that if you had disk galaxies in a cosmological simulation with uniform mass resolution, and the low mass halos will be heated much more, the low mass galaxies, I should say, will be heated much more than the high mass ones. And so you'll see some evolution in the kinematics. The panels on the right, by the way, are the same quantities 
just measured and plotted as a function of time and just measured at the half mass radius of the galaxy. And let me just like reiterate that these curves should not evolve at all, right? There should be no evolution in any of these curves. They should all be coincident with these dotted lines here. That's the initial profiles for this particular galaxy. So now we can model it conveniently, but I mean, you can't reverse the effect, but at least you can, you can assess the magnitude of the effect. And what we, what we used for this was a theoretical calculation by Cedric Lacey and Jerry Ostreicher that was published in 1985. And what they were interested in was measuring, trying to put constraints on the macho mass of black holes if the dark matter halo of the Milky Way was made of black holes. Right? So at the time, black holes were viable candidates for dark matter, so it was a sensible thing to do. Um, and so it's interesting, actually, because the number that they came up with was about 10 to the 6 solar masses. If, dark matter, if the dark matter particles were black holes and their masses were more massive than 10 to the 6 solar masses, then the Milky Way, this galaxy, the, the, the actual like, Milky Way galaxy itself would be hotter in the vertical direction than it's observed to be. Right? So it's interesting because that 10 to the 6 is comparable to the dark matter particle mass that people are using for cosmological simulations. So we really should have known since the 80s that this effect was going to be present in simulations. And anyway, it, it actually works quite well. Their theoretical calculation, which is not a model, is not a fit, is actually a calculation, actually matches the data of the simulations really well. And that's shown with the blue lines, which is compared to the black lines, which are the simulations in this plot. This is just one example of... Uh, the evolution of the vertical velocity dispersion um, in, in a, one particular galaxy simulated with different numerical resolution. Now in practice, we don't use that equation. We use the one that's down here at the bottom. And I know it looks very different, but is, is actually not very different. If you define T naught here and T veer to be what's stated there, the, well, T naught sets the initial velocity dispersion of the disk. That's not a free parameter. It's just like a, one of the independent variables. And t is the time scale at which the stars basically become so heated that they become unbound to the dark matter halo. Then you can take this expression and do the first order Taylor expansion. And for early, for low values of t, you basically get back exactly uh, the Lacey and Ostreicher model or, or you know, theoretical result. The only difference then is that it asymptotically approaches a constant velocity dispersion at late times instead of going to infinite, infinite heating. Um, so another useful thing is that once you, once you know and have a model for the vertical velocity dispersion and how it evolves, you can just plug that into the hydrostatic equilibrium equation and solve for the vertical scale height of galaxies and then understand the evolution of the vertical scale height. So you get some information on the structure of galaxies and how that evolves in response to the collisional heating. And so there are, again, no additional free parameters here. You just basically calculate at what thickness of the disk does the gravitational force due to the dark matter halo and due to the stars balance the kinetic energy that's, that's in the stars and that's injected due to the interactions with the dark matter particles? And so you, you can do it analytically for a thin disk, and that's shown as the orange lines in this plot here. This is the half mass scale height as a function of time measured at some fiducial radius in a galaxy, in a Milky Way mass galaxy. And it turns out if the disk becomes very thick, then that thin disk approximation doesn't work. And you can see that for this you know, lowest particle, highest particle mass here, lowest resolution. Uh, and so then you have to abandon the thin disk approximation and actually do the, do the integrals numerically and, and assume a thick disk, but then it still works uh, extremely well, right? So we have some constraints on this. Um, now, of course, all of this affects how, what we see for galaxy morphologies and simulations. And even if every galaxy formed as a perfect disk, you would see some differences in their, in their morphology at some time after their formation, just due to the fact that they're resolved with different numbers of particles. And that's what's shown in this plot right here. This is by Matt Wilkinson. He has a poster that's related to this stuff too that I can refer you to. Uh, so this is uh, Kappa wrote this, the fraction of kinetic energy in the disk stars that's in ordered rotation. All right? So it should be one or close to one because most of the stars are initially in an ordered, you know, coherently rotating disk. And what you see is that in the low resolution simulations, or basically in all of them, there's some decrease in this parameter, this kappa rho parameter. And it becomes increasingly bad as you go towards the green and orange and blue curves. And those are the sort of lower resolution simulations that we've studied. And actually it goes from being rotationally supported to, to basically dispersion supported in the lowest 
resolution simulations we've studied. Uh, this is uh, V over sigma, so this is familiar to a lot of people, and it's the same set of simulations that I showed in the, in the last plot and in the previous plots. And again, what you see is that a rotationally supported disk, in many cases, can actually become a dispersion-supported elliptical-like structure. The different panels, by the way, are just measured at different characteristic radii along the extent of the disk, so that R50, for example, is the, the <coughs> radius that encloses 50% of the stars initial 50% initial of the stars, because there is some evolution in the, in the characteristic radii of these systems as well. All right, so, so far that was, this is my last sort of, sort of slide with results on it. Um, I need to go quickly, because we're past time now, please. Okay, this is, uh, just to say a couple words about this, this is uh, the results from now cosmological simulations where we repeated the same simulation as the Eagle simulation, actually, and we just increased the number of dark matter particles in order to smooth out the dark matter potential, right? To make it less clumpy due to Poisson noise. And just in this top left panel here, you can see the size mass relation. So the black line is Eagle, and then the blue and the orange lines are what you get if you increase the dark matter mass resolution by a factor of four or a factor of seven, all right? And so then you smooth out potential, galaxies grow less, actually. And I'll just end there and leave my summary up. Yes, we do have um, time for, for, for maybe one, or one quick question before we wrap up. I see a question from um, Ruby Wright who asks, how far away are we from large cosmological simulations that we can trust the morphologies from? Uh, well, I mean, we'll, this, this, you can't get rid of this effect, right? It's going to be present in all simulations. The question is, over what mass scales can we trust the morphologies? I think that's what we need to pin down here. Um, I guess, it, you know, one way to answer that question is to say, we need to suppress spurious heating in all dark matter halos that will form stars, right? So basically you can suppress it in 10 to the eight solar mass halos, then you can trust the results of all those simulations. And I think in terms of cosmological simulations, like the size of Eagle or something like that, we're a long way away. A real long way away. <laughs> and I, I guess the, the follow up to that it would be that if, if it always happens in small galaxies, does that mean it persists all the way along? Um, you know, that the, the, the trajectory altering problem in early times or at low masses messes everything up all the way, you know, to, to the biggest things at the latest times. In principle, yes, that's right. So the progenitors of even very well resolved galaxies today will be affected by this heating mechanism uh, and their satellites will as well. But, you know, it's an integrated effect, right? So it takes a certain amount of time for it to kick in and become important. So, I mean, I don't have the answers really to these questions, but I, you're, you're, you're definitely right, yeah. Well, on that very, very cheery note, um, <laughs> draw this session to a, to a close. Um, thank you to all the speakers, but um, thank you especially to the audience. I'm, I'm really impressed at the quality um, and the, co the, the, um, the collegiality, the, 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 um, just the niceness of the discussion in the Slack. I think that's, that's a really nice addition to a, a conference experience, <laughs> even, even from home. Um, I don't know if there are any housekeeping um, announcements from the organizers. I'll rely on them to take control of the microphone, but otherwise have a great night. Um, enjoy all the best that Melbourne has to offer or wherever you are.